the AB 931, which would change the standard for police use of lethal force and make it much more, uh, much more, make it more difficult for the police to use lethal force. We also worked on supporting SB 10, the bill that did get passed and got rid of money bail in California. We worked on that with our state representatives and worked on getting a resolution to the council. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, we stopped working on that when the ACLU nationwide in Northern California not only withdrew their support, they had been one of the primary sponsors, but actively worked against the bill because there were so many changes in the bill that the concern is that it will actually result in more vulnerable people, poor people, people of color remaining behind bars rather than less, despite getting rid of money bail. So that's, 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 and that bill was now on hold, that law is now on hold even though it got passed because the bail industry, which of course would be completely wiped out, literally eliminated by this bill, got enough signatures to put it on the ballot in 2020, so that bill is not going to be enforced for at least 2020. Um, we met with court administrators and sheriff's personnel to work on ways to reduce ISIS presence in the courts and end the practice of ICE agents coming to court to find and arrest people for immigration issues. Uh, we're working on that, and it ain't happening yet, but we're working on it. Um, we success, successfully lobbied the police department to make changes in its policies regarding its interactions with ICE. Uh, we also successfully uh, discussed with the sheriff's department changing their internal policy on the use of drones uh, to help protect some First Amendment, Amendment activities, like demonstrations. Um, we attended and monitored the police department's de-escalation training for its officers. Uh, particularly in light of the, you know, the tragic death of Sean Harrell uh, a, a year ago, 2017. Um, and those records, by the way, are going to get released under this new law, as are the records from the Sheriff's Department regarding the investigation of the death of Duke Smith in half times. Um, we continued our years-long Civil Liberties Watch, which is an effort that we engage in continuously to look at the agendas for the city councils. In the, in, within the county and with the Board of Supervisors to look for the civil liberties issues and to lobby the elected representatives when that's appropriate. We successfully lobbied our parent organization, the ACLU of Northern California, to formally endorse and support Measure M. Um, we, uh, we met with supervisors representatives to address reducing the enormous court fees that many people may not know about that are added on to most tickets and that triple, quadruple, quintuple the cost of getting a ticket for many different things, including sleeping outside, but also traffic tickets. Um, we help support a number of events by participating in the events, including giving money, co-sponsoring, advertising, attending the event, including the NAACP Freedom Fund Gala, the Pride Marches in both Santa Cruz and Watsonville, the Santa Cruz entry and a national rolling hunger strike, which was set to, to demand the release and reunification of families separated at the border by the Trump administration. The annual Queer Youth Leadership Awards and Resource Fair. And most recently, the third annual Christmas dinner at the Ma. So what are we going to do in 2019? Well, we've already this month co-sponsored, uh, participated in the Women's March and the NLK, NLK March for the Dream. Next up, we're co-sponsoring and participating in the annual Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Convocation put on by UCSC. I suspect most of you know about that. If you've never been, it's really an extraordinary event, inspirational speakers. It's coming up uh, February 11th at 7 p.m. at Pacific. I urge you all to attend. I think it's free. Sure it's yeah. Free. Yeah, it's free. It's open to the public, and it's a wonderful event. But get there early. Get there early. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm confident we're going to continue the work that we did this year on bail reform and limiting when the police can use deadly force. Uh, we actually have a retreat next weekend. We're going to formally decide on our priorities for the year. And please, either today or any other day, you can see us or via our website, which is uh, standingcruzaclu.org. Give us your ideas for what I think we should be working on. We'd love to hear from you. Our purpose is to serve you guys uh, and the rest of the community. Uh, so thank you very much for attending. Uh, I'm now going to introduce Ben Rice, who is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Good afternoon, and thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, I get to introduce to you uh, one of my heroes, uh, John Burris. Uh, if you will look at his... 
if you look at John Burris's webpage, you'll, you'll see that it starts with, this is America, you deserve justice. And so, you know, you picked the right person to come and talk to you today, because he has represented some very important people yeah. that we've all heard about, and, and he actually has some history in our county that uh, uh, I feel very, very fortunate and proud to have been a small part of. You may remember back in the uh, early 90s, we were trying to get a civilian review board for the, the police department. We had a very different kind of law enforcement world in Santa Cruz County. It's much improved, I have to say. But back then, it was real important to a number of us that we get some sort of civilian review. And uh, during that, uh, I got a call one day from a fellow that said, hey, I've got the Rodney King tape for Santa Cruz County. And I knew this guy, and then he got ready. Well, bring it by. So we brought the tape over, and it, was a, it showed a sheriff deputy beating on a man uh, with his baton. And meanwhile, the man's wife was videotaping this, and the two little kids, three little kids, and this man's mother were screaming, stop, stop, stop. And this guy whacked him several times. You could hear the blows of his baton on his elbow and on his, his leg. And I, I, so I said, well, this is, this is remarkable. Like, what the heck is this? And he says, well, I just was able to get this from the district attorney's office. This happened months ago, and the DA was refusing to turn this over. Mm. So when we were trying to get a civilian review board, we keep saying to people, you know, who's policing the police? And they'd always say, well, the DA's office. Yeah. Well, the DA didn't want anybody to see this video, but it was finally turned over. So he shows this to me, I said, well, listen, is it okay for our group to show this, to show what actually is going on with the DA's office when there's this kind of a problem? He says, well, I'll, I'll find out. So the next day he called me, he says, yes, they say, go ahead and show it. So I invited KSBW to come to my office and I had one of those little cheap televisions with a VCR attached. And I put it on and they were shocked, so they recorded it shooting off of my little TV screen this remarkable scene. That night it went national news. It was shown over and over and over again because it is really, really shocking. The next day I get a call from George Nichols, the victim of this incident. And George goes, who are you? And how did you get this tape? And George had been walking in his hometown in Arizona with a friend in a shopping center, and there was a, a, a large window in one of the department stores with all these TVs, and there he was, his friend says, George, you're on television. <laughs> so George calls up and finds out who I am, and says, I never heard from this guy, and but I'm, I'm delighted. And so he flew, flew up to Santa Cruz, and this fellow that turned over the tape was uh, uh, not, not the right guy, what to say. To, uh, to, to handle this case, and George said, look, I, I'm, I'm not going to use this guy. I'd like you to represent me. I said, look, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I've been doing this for about 10 years, but I'm not equipped to do a, a civil rights uh, lawsuit like this. And it's a completely different kind of office. So I said to George, look, I've been around long enough. I know lots of great lawyers in the Bay Area and California. Let me see if I can find somebody for you. And that's how I tremendous, tremendous lawyer, and despite everything that was thrown up, like the grand jury being misled and saying, oh, there was nothing wrong here, or despite the district attorney saying, see, I told you there's nothing wrong here, and despite the sheriff saying, this is the sheriff a long time ago, long gone, unfortunately, saying there was nothing wrong with here. So, John was uh, just a tremendous, tremendous guy. So, uh, I wanted to point out, I have off of this webpage, pulled a bunch of things off to talk about some of the cases. These are, there's a tremendous list of big cases he's been involved with and awards he's received, and I invite you to look at his webpage to see that stuff. But when Bob asked me to introduce him, he said, yeah, take two or three minutes. He said, criminal defense lawyer, two or three minutes, uh, and I'm clear my throat. So I'm going to be very brief here in, in describing these awards. 
the National Bar Association Hall of Fame inductee in 2017, the Global Directory of Who's Who Top Lawyers Lifetime Member in recognition of hard work, dedication, and contributions to the legal profession 2016, the National Academy of Personal Injury Attorneys 2015 Nationally Ranked Top 10 Attorney Award, the National Lawyers Guild San Francisco Chapters Champion of Justice Award, the National Bar Association C. Francis Stratford Award, the highest award given by the association for inspiration and contribution to the legal profession. Two more. Top 100 Influential Lawyers in California by the California Daily Journal. And the 2003 Peace and Justice Award from California State University Center for African Peace and Conflict Resolution in 2003. John has appeared on, this is the, uh, the California lawyer, it is the most important, I guess, uh, mm. magazine in California among lawyers, and as the, the title is Burris's Beat, Taking on the Cops. So John has not only taken on police, but he's taken on the fight for uh, all sorts of discrimination and, and bias. He is fearless. And we are so lucky to have him among us in this, the fights that we're all involved with. I think he's the absolutely appropriate individual to come and speak to you today. So please welcome John Burke. Sports and American African American athletes 
those who engage in advocacy had on, had on me as I developed as a young man. And so I decided that that would be my thing. Uh, for today, it would be just a new one. But it also gives you that this intersection, which I think is appropriate today, Super Bowl Sunday, and the issues uh, surrounding um, the, uh, the impact that Kaepernick has had uh, on it. And also shows, again, that social change can come from the advocacy of sports stars. And that's what happened to me as I was growing up. Now, I'll take back a little bit and start. You know, I'm, I'm a child of the 50s, and as I was growing up, I was, like most kids my age, very much into baseball. Baseball was the sport. It was way before football became uh, a global industry, or even the NBA basketball. But, but baseball was. And so in my household, there was much discussion about baseball. And part of the discussion was about the Negro Leagues. Uh, Jack Robinson had already uh, obviously been playing, and I grew up, was starting to grow up in, in the Giants, uh, not before they moved here, but when Willie Mays was in New York. And, and so, as a kid, you know, baseball seemed to be everything. But what I didn't understand at the time, as I was watching this uh, and hearing it from my men talking about baseball, and uh, and developing some sense about what was the social context of baseball. I didn't know about uh, the discrimination of baseball had long uh, had been there for years and years and years and that the Negro League had, uh, players could not play for back in sports. And a true story, when I did learn this to be a fact, this was like I was 10 years old. And at the time I was uh, gathering baseball cards like all kids 10 years old. And I had a whole slew of them and one of my very good friends uh, and he and I used to trade the cards and talk about the players and all the, all the stars of the 20s and 30s and 40s. But then the realization came to me that when all these stars had become stars, whether it was Hank Greenberg, or Babe Ruth, or Lou Gehrig, Ty Cobb, all of them, which I knew all of them in their records, that they all set these records when African Americans could not play. And this was very shocking to me because I grew up in Vallejo, California. We didn't have, and everything was integrated from the as as I can remember. So I didn't have uh, experience with uh, segregation. And my, but my parents were from the South. And they were. And they understood. And they all um, talked about the fact. And so I became, I became very aware of this. But I will tell you this I threw away every card I had. Of self -care. And I was a 10 year old. What did I know, right? I didn't, all I know is that the players that my parents, which my dad, particularly, and uncles were talking about was Satchel Paige, and Josh Gibson, you know, uh, uh, Judy Bell, and you know, just a guy. Just, you come to my office and see all these players on the wall, and I'll show some of them to you in a few minutes. But uh, not yet. And that, uh, that it had tremendous impact on me in terms of um, my. Uh, early development. Now, then, you know, in 1955 or so, Brown versus Board of Education had been decided a year before, but in 1955, the second opinion, I can't tell you that I clearly understood what it meant, but I can tell you, I saw the headlines when I, in, when I, in 1954, I knew something was important. It, it, it had that kind of impact on me. So I'm learning about the discrimination that took place in, in baseball, then I'm hearing about reading and hearing about the South, certainly in 55. Uh, we had the, the issue around uh, Emmett Till, um, and then um, Rosa Parks. These were things that were ugly to me as a, as a young kid who wanted to be taught these things in school. But I'm like watching this. What does this mean? And I didn't understand and appreciate the discrimination that was taking place in terms of the public schools and riding the buses and things of that nature. So I'm trying to process this information. And at the same time, while this is going on, I am uh, playing ball, but I'm also watching and listening uh, to what I can see. And during this period of time, Bill Russell was a star at USF. Some of you may know it. He was a basketball star there. And my father, I would sit with my dad and watch uh, these games. And he would tell me about the, the, the difficulty that these teams had in going south and playing 
in the South. And again, this was all troubling. None of the southern teams that you see at the, the cotton bowl, the sugar bowl, and all of those bowls at that time did not allow black players to play. And during that period of time, Jim Brown, who was then uh, a star, had been a star at Syracuse University, uh, could not go to one of these bowls. And then later, it became clear that what we were dealing with then was uh, a form of discrimination. And so I continued to watch uh, this movement of, of things and, and, uh, as I was growing up, impacting and, you know, not necessarily looking at this from a career choice, I was just seeing that there was some injustice that was taking place. And so I followed um, what was going on in the civil rights movement, certainly, uh, from Rosa Parks uh, on, Martin Luther King. Uh, I, before he to speak in 63, I had already become conscious enough to appreciate the kind of issues he was talking about. Uh, and so I was impacted by that. By then I'm reading and hearing and, uh, and, and trying to make sense of, of the world as it was. But I also noted that the athletes were people who were also making statements. And I followed what they were saying from that period of time and became much more knowledgeable about the history of, of, of what uh, was going on. Uh, and sports, the sports as advocates, Bill Russell was a clear advocate. Uh, when he was at the Boston Celtics, and, and, uh, and, and so I, I was that. Of course, Jackie Robinson, by the time I became really of age and aware, had, had retired. And then by then, he had become a clear civil rights advocate, uh, involving himself with Dr. King uh, and, and the civil rights market. At a time when he was perceived as a Republican, I didn't know what that meant at the time, but uh, uh, he was not uh, well received by a lot of different folks. And so I. Uh, was concerned about uh, listening to all of that. So it, it goes on, and, and, and when I get ultimately, uh, Muhammad Ali uh, then becomes uh, an extraordinarily important person for me during the 1960s. Uh, certainly, we were very, uh, everyone was following his movement uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a as a uh, boxer. But I think the most dramatic part is when he decided not to go to Vietnam. Yes. And that, and that, really, that really hit home with me because that showed me a certain form of accuracy. Uh, that, and, and I had a chance to meet, not meet him meeting, but he came to Oakland, and there he was. Uh, he had lost his title, and he was in Oakland, and he was talking to us uh, about what it meant. You know, at the time, it's hard for me to capture what a beautiful dude he was. <laughs> so a very handsome guy, very articulate, a lot of fun, tell a lot of jokes, quick jokes and all, but he had sacrificed. And that's a sacrifice that cost him his, uh, his title. And, and so by then I'm sort of formulating my sense that real injustice is taking place in the world, where I fit and all of that. The 1968 was a huge, huge year, of course. That was the year Dr. King was killed. That was the year that Robert Kennedy was killed as well. So these were, those were important times for me. And then we had the Olympics, and that's when Harry Edwards, uh, who uh, developed a friendship with, uh, proposed um, the uh, boycott of the 1968 Olympics. And he uh, ultimately convinced John Carlos and a number of others to participate. Now, he, he himself, uh, was uh, denied. I mean, he was, he, was a, he was a scholar at the time, but what he did was kind of plant the seeds for these men uh, to participate. And that was a major, major movement, major step. It also shows uh, the profile and courage aspect of civil rights work because he was, uh, they were successful in making a statement, but they were unsuccessful in terms of what their careers ultimately landed in. Each of them uh, were essentially um, uh, uh, placed in a position. Uh, where they lost basically their careers. And so that was an important aspect, certainly, for me. And then you go on a little bit further because in the 1960s, 1968, the Black Panthers uh, started in Oakland. Um, although I wasn't a member of the Panthers, but I was a person at the time who was watching and listening. So not only Dr. King before 1968, before he passed, but still with Mark Carmichael. Um, and Adrian Brown, uh, figures that you would know, all had a message 
that resonated with me in one way or the other, and it formulated, formulated my sense of where I was going to wind up being. And so, I will say that, and then later, another startling moment was Kurt Flood. Kurt Flood, he's from Oakland, you know, and uh, he was with the St. Louis Cardinals. And there were a couple of good books that were written about the 1964 Cardinals. And he himself uh, decided that he was not, quote, be a slave to the restricted uh, contract that they had in existence. And so for me, that was a significant statement of a protest. But again, uh, he lost. And he essentially was ostracized from baseball after that. Um, he never was able to regain his career. But his courage was something that I thought and remembered extraordinarily as important. Uh, and it certainly had a dramatic impact on me. After that, though, I have to show you that in 1968, which is, you know, in 1972, I was, I was in Chicago at the time, you know, working at a law firm. And, and Mayor Daly, Richard Daly, was the mayor. And during that summer, there was a huge, huge um, uh, call for students to come assist because many of uh, uh, Ralph Metcalf, uh, many of his uh, associates and friends had been attacked and beaten by the police, and he was outraged by it. So I spent the summer of 72 essentially interviewing people who, in fact, had been beaten by the police. It, beaten up by the police. It was sort of my first foyer and the first hand connection with it. Before that, of course, I seen the civil rights movement, I seen the police and all of those interacting uh, with, uh, uh, with, the, with them, uh, with, with using their dogs and using police power. So I was pretty much impacted by that as well. But certainly by 1972, I, I was in law school. I got real experience dealing with those issues. And it resonated with me and it went to the core of my being and ultimately formed the essence of my whole practice as the kind of lawyer that I had become. And that was in 1972. Since then, of course, I've gone on to practice um, law in, the, uh, in this whole area. I want to go back now, though, um, before I take questions here and, and go through some of these things here. Right here is in the back side. This is, I literally was at this particular, uh, I was at the pull out from here. There you go. Yes. At this, uh, up here we have uh, 1972, Ralph Metcalf was right here. Uh, before that, Ralph Metcalf was one of the fastest humans in the world. He was in the 1936 Olympics and the 32 Olympics. He ran against Jesse Owens. He came in second. But, but here he was a, con he was a uh, congressman in 1972. And so he put together this young students, many students, and I was one of them, and we spent the summer interviewing uh, many people that had been beat up by the police. And so, in fact, a report has been written, uh, Misuse of Police Authority in Chicago, that you can see if you want, but it really de detailed for me this real personal experience with policing, and that, um, and, and that it resonated with me in such a way that I uh, understood that communities are abused by the police and there was no recourse. And it sort of formulated my sense of being uh, from then on in terms of the police. But also it suggested to me that you can do more than just have an individual case. That there really are opportunities to have an impact and change the particular system in place. As Ben talked about trying to put together a review board uh, and uh, down here, well, one of my first major cases is 1979, when the young the boy got beaten up, not beaten up, killed by the police. He was shot a number of times. So I always tell him before Oscar Grant, before some of the other cases, there was another black 14 year old who was shot and killed. And, and from that, we were able to not only deal with the case, but we also, I was hired as a private, you know, as an independent investigator by the city. Uh, I'm sure what decision they thought they made, but that uh, was one that was important. And so from that, um, a system review board was put in place and, and, and has been there for the most part ever since. Uh, and, and, and other police review boards developed a consequence of that around the country. But I have been thinking about those issues a lot. Uh, then, let me go back. Go back. 
Go to the top, go to the top. So here's what I wanted to bring to your attention. I, as I talk to you about Negro ball, many of you have seen, maybe, maybe, uh, uh, seen the documentary of uh, Ken Burns. If you did, there was one called When the Ball Was White. And it was a fabulous exhibit that he had. But when I was a kid, listening to men talk about Negro ball, this was very, very important. Uh, Kansas, City, Kansas City Marks were the, the best, best teams of that era, along with the Homestead Great. Just so you know, that these teams played in the Major League ballparks. When Major League teams left on the way, then the black ball players would come in and play. And, and this was a, a period of time from the 20s, 30s, and into the 40s. It only stopped after uh, uh, Jackie Robinson uh, integrated, integrated baseball. It continued on for another 15 years, but ultimately it, it terminated. But these were, these were the heroes of the African American community who were that day. Uh, and and uh, on. So here's one that all of you may like. Okay? This is a picture of Willie Mays uh, with the Chattanooga Choo Choo's <laughs> when he was like 17 years old. You know, this is him right here. He later went on to play with the Birmingham Barons, but uh, this is what it, this is how he was. He was a kid. Hank Aaron played on another team uh, right after that, the Birmingham team as well. But uh, this is what this is. And, and this had, more, had a cultural component to it because this was the entertainment of, of the black community. This is where they went for entertainment. Black ball was everything. And many of these players played against the white players when the off season. And they would report, these black guys were black, but the major league owner, for whatever reason, for well, whatever reason, did not allow them to play. Now here's some of the stars, you know, that, that when I was a kid I'd hear about. Of course, the most famous is Satchel Page, you know, he's the most famous uh, pitcher of, uh, of his day. And the second most famous guy was, um, uh, what's that name uh, again? Josh Gibson. Josh Gibson was the home runner. He was uh, reported to be the black baby of his day. He and Satchel really thought that they should have been brought to the majors before Jackie Robinson. They were older uh, and, you know, yeah. And, and better players by, by all accounts, but they were both passed over. Ultimately, um, uh, Josh Gibson died shortly thereafter, after Jackie Robinson was promoted to the major. Satchel Page was, ultimately came up, uh, but he was well into his 40s. And he held the rookie of the year. He played for the Cleveland Indians uh, at the time. So again, these were things that uh, I would hear as a kid, uh, not in 48, but you know, I heard about them as players. This is, a, this is an important concept here. This, this is 1936, of course, and by the time I was a kid, I, was, I knew about Jesse Owens, of course. Many of you may have known about him as well. And on the platform here, I'm going to is Ralph Metcalf, uh, who was the lady talking with the congressman. And this is Ralph Metcalf up here. He was fast, fast, fast as well. And they were two fastest humans. Although there was a guy who supported me, I can't remember his name, and I was faster than both of them. But he pulled a hamstring before trial and didn't make the team. This person here is Matt Robinson, Jackie Robinson's older brother. And you can see, and he was really fast too. He was uh, uh, 20, he was in the Olympics, 36 Olympics, and unfortunately for him, uh, he was not well to see when he came back. And, and so none of these guys were able to, not to say none, uh, Ralph Metcalf actually did as well. Jesse Owens had a hard time in China to make a living at the Olympics. There wasn't a lot of uh, people for him. And, and he, and I think what's important here is that he really felt that and that he had been not received in proper accolades for what he had done uh, in the Olympics and standing up to Hitler. Yeah. Now this is a, a famous post here. Uh, that if you come to my house, I would say to you, I have this picture in my house. And I say, can you tell me who the, the people who, if you like baseball, and a lot of guys might they know baseball, I say, okay. Well, let me tell let me see if you can identify the people in this picture. This is an all-star game, 1953, uh, in Chicago. And of course, you can see it's, it's a Negro, Negro all-star game. All the players and people are trying there. And there's Danny Robinson, age 16. And then over the other side of Cleveland uh, is, is Larry Doe. 
These were people who were very important at the time, but most the person that very few people ever guessed, except a few that I've met down the years, could guess who this young person is there. That's the challenge for most. And that that is a young from Chicago, and you know Bernie Banks, right? And that's Bernie Banks as a young kid uh, before he came up to the major. He had a lot of his career uh, with Dodge. And then, you know, um, now, so at this time, I, I really didn't know all that was happening in the world around uh, discrimination and why we have this thing that's taking place. Now, this is something that, um, as a kid, uh, in our household, you know, Joe Lewis was everything. You know, Joe Lewis, you know, I'm still a real kid, and he's not really playing uh, boxing anymore, but in, the, in, in our household, and, black community, Joe Lewis was still um, the preeminent person in sports. Uh, in the early 50s, uh, he certainly was not boxing uh, competitively in, in a way, uh, but um, he was a uh, person that everyone talked about certainly in the 40s and 50s, and my, and my parents certainly and, and relatives all talked about him. And certainly the, the, the fight with Max Millian is one that is um, a folklore. You know, this is Paul Roberson. And you know, Paul Roberson to me was an important, important person. Uh, even as a young man growing up, certainly by the time I became of okay, age, the reason because Paul Roberson had been a great athlete. He was one of the first African Americans, all Americans in Princeton. And he then went to law school at Columbia. So I, but he couldn't get a job of any significance after that. But he had this great talent, of course, as a, as a singer and entertainer. He went out and did that uh, for many years. But he still was a very significant advocate for civil rights. There were a lot of issues around communism and where he went and stuff of that nature. But to me, he was a real uh, upfront person that in our household he was talked about and revered. Uh, so in the 50s, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember him. Uh, as being an outspoken leader of civil rights, and it impacted me in terms of my sense of, 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 of what civil rights was. Here I have, uh, this is more Bill Russell. Uh, Bill Russell, um, <coughs> this is more contemporary, but Bill Russell, as you may not know, is from Oakland, and you know, from Connors High School in Oakland. Here he's at the last off star game of Green uh, Bar in Grand Hill. Uh, but he was one of the few uh, early spokespersons, and, and certainly I followed his career when he was there because he was an outspoken person. Uh, Bill Russell didn't take any mess from anybody. I'm um, letting you know what he's thinking think one at all times. And uh, there is a comment I think I have here somewhere that, that kind of illustrates that. You know, um, Bill Russell was not a guy that. Uh, Jack Robinson became a real advocate, uh, civil rights advocate, after he left. 
Uh, he did one thing that, that had a very negative impact. I don't think I knew of it at the time, but I did learn of it. And that is he testified on the, in the, in the, for the Committee on House on American uh, Antiquity. And he testified against Paul Robeson. And I remember, you know, that my dad was very much happy about it. You know, Jack Robinson was probably, um, in his long career, probably would say that it was the worst decision he ever made. But it was very hurtful, hurtful to the African American community at the time because he was such a guy, you know, and there he was testifying against another guy who was also revered by individuals, and, and he uh, himself um, had suffered one of the all time great photos. This, this one here, this is Jackie Robinson's home. Uh, and Yogi Bear to this day, he's dead now, he lived the rest of his life saying that Jackie Robinson was out. <laughs> you know, so it's uh, a great, great uh, sense of history. But, yeah. And this was at that time when the doctors had essentially on all that, a significant black population number of athletes, and the Yankees did not. And because most of the major league baseball teams did not integrate for many years. I think the last one to do so was the Boston Red Sox, which uh, was Pumsey Green, who was from Richmond. And, and I had a chance to meet him and, and work with him on some matters, and, and he would talk about the challenge that he was presented when he went to the Boston Red Sox. But, but for me, uh, back in the time when the Dodgers, not the Dodgers, when the Red Sox didn't have black ball players, well, it was noted. And I certainly didn't root for them. I think it's only recently that I can get my mind on the ball from the Red Sox because they got a lot of players, and, you know, good players too, and African American players as well, and Latin players. But back in those days, not all teams uh, integrated uh, easily. My wife is from Philadelphia, and Philadelphia, big town as it is. Did not integrate. And the other ones, if you saw some of the Jackie Robinson movies, they were the most vitriolic uh, in their response to Jackie coming into the major league. So, uh, and this is kind of a merger, you know, uh, if you take the context of what was going on at that point in time. And I became, I was still 10 years old, but I was seeing uh, these different uh, aspects and, and they're affecting my, starting to affect my thinking. Now this is a period of time when I'm really uh, starting to uh, get hold of things uh, in terms of my clear, clear thinking. Uh, you have Martin Luther King, you have Muhammad Ali, you have Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, and you know you can see Muhammad Ali is just a joy, you know, just a personality. But these are serious times because he is being uh, connected with two of the greatest men of that generation. You have you can deal with philosophy, you can tell who you might like, who you didn't like, but these men had followers. And I was a kid, I didn't follow them, I just admired them all. Uh, if they had something to say, I'm processing what was being said. And in fact, I have a picture in my office now with Malcolm X and Martin Luther King that a mirrors the picture, and you have one eye for both, and it's basically saying two guys is looking out, uh, out of a lens, and they see things differently on one side, or they see things the same through one uh, island. So this is an important period of time. Of course, this is, everyone remembers this. This is, uh, this is well, go back, go back. The iconic, the iconic picture here of uh, uh, Muhammad Ali standing over Sonny Liston. Uh, this was, I mean, I listened to this fight, it was like shocking. But by then, Muhammad Ali had become, you know, the preeminent person. I always thought this was just doing this by the check. I mean, it just it went down much too quickly and too softly, but, you know. But for history, this is the picture you get of uh, Muhammad Ali in sort of time. Huh. Now, this picture here had a, it was a significant picture uh, and, and coming together because these were people who all came together top athletes of that day, and I remember this very clearly, this, this meeting where in 1967, where, you know, you have uh, Bill Russell, Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, who knew at the time was an outstanding running back. We had Kareem Adu, the bar who then was known as Lou Al Center. He was just, uh, you know, they had Carl Stokes, who was, who was a representative who later became the mayor of Cleveland. You had Bobby Mitchell, who was a star running back at the time, uh, Al Wu. Uh, Wu John, who became a leader, a real leader, uh, and, and 
Sports Management. And then you had uh, Davis, who was a Green Bay Packers linebacker. But these were, these were tough, tough guys. And, uh, and for them to gather, and it really was one of the first times that people of this prominence would kind of stick their necks up. Now, they were all top athletes uh, in their own areas, and uh, they, cared, they carried a lot of respect. And so I clearly noted this at the time and um, tried to figure out what this really meant. But certainly, it, it, it impacted my sort of thinking about what athletes can do and their advocacy and for a cause. Uh, that's pretty much what we see from time to time. Of course, this is the iconic picture of uh, uh, John Carlos and, John, and, and uh, Thomas Smith. In 1968, you know, I had run some tracks in that period of time. Now, I was like a, a buddy compared to these guys. Right? <laughs> they were, John Carlos and, and Thomas Smith were at San Jose State called Speed City. And Ronnie Ray Smith, uh, they were the fastest guys in the world because their, their, their teams were uh, amazing in 1968. I'll tell you another person who was an amazing track person in 1968. And that was what they was at USC. He was as fast as any, any one of these guys, not that fast, but clearly fast. But this was a, another statement. Harry Edwards had put this together in terms of helping them understand and appreciate the power that they had. And, and certainly I remember it uh, very well. Again, it impacted me in such a way so that sports, you can't change things through sports you can have a particular impact. However, it takes courage. And that courage, obviously, could cost. It could cost in your careers. Uh, often, and by then, I was the name of John Kennedy's profile in courage, but I understood you could lose. This is one I mentioned to you earlier. This was, to me, one of the most significant uh, athletes of his day, and that's Kurt Flood. Because Kurt Flood had been a star center fielder for the St. Louis Cardinals. And, um, and they had won the championship in 1964 and in 1968, the World Series, I should say. And he was one of the, the, the leaders on that team. And he said, he got traded to the Philadelphia Phillies. He basically said, I'm not going. And so, again, it's an example of what an athlete can do because even though he lost, what happened is it became the forerunner of the doing away with the reserve clause that folks had. That from that, from this case, even though he lost, from there, Major League Baseball decided they had to enter into the association with the athletes, which is why you had a steady movement. I think Andy Messerschmitt was the first to get a big contract related to this. But it came about, this is one of the real giants of uh, social uh, activism here. I don't know if he's ever gotten the kind of credit that he deserves, but, but he deserves a lot. Uh, unfortunately for him, he never really got to play baseball uh, much after that. He just played for the Washington Senators, but by then he'd been out of baseball two or three years, so his career was basically over. We have a field in Oakland named after him, but I view him as one of the really great men in terms of moving the social justice agenda. I talked about this earlier. This is a signature point moment for me because this is when I sort of became clear uh, in my thinking that I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer and uh, being there. And over time, of course, within a matter of years, I sort of honed in on doing police stuff. I did a lot of other civil rights stuff. But at the core of me was the issues of police misconduct. Because, in my own mind, the most vulnerable person here in this whole system is an African American male in connected with the police. Because of the stereotypes that, that exist, they're very vulnerable. So I've uh, taken as my mission to represent them in all manners, um, and, I, and I'm happy I get to do it, you know, uh, and that uh, uh, it has sort of crystallized uh, uh, into my uh, soul, if you will. So I, now, going forward, you know, many years have passed since then, and I've been involved in different cases in, in different areas, but uh, with athletes as well, I represent a number of athletes, uh, not in civil rights matters, but and athletes that just that, that on a professional level are involved in different kinds of things. But I've had a chance to represent them. I have a video that I want to play that captain, the one I did a while ago, 
um, and Captain first um, took his stance, I took a stance as well. And I want to play that now.
the NFL has said that players are encouraged but not required to stand for the anthem. Until 2009, no NFL player stood for the national anthem. The players were moved to the field during the national anthem because it was seen as a marketing strategy to make the athletes look more patriotic. There's substantial evidence of African American athletes being courageous, standing up for what they believe. Many will not even protest in support of Colin Kaepernick. The more people do it, I can guarantee you that the rest of the population will take notice. He's not talking about it. Other communities, other than African American communities, things can get done. Uh, all I can say 
is that it's disappointing not to see more players, African-American players, but I also recognize that uh, many of these athletes have a lot of options. So just look at what's happening right now with the player from Oklahoma, Kelly Murray. Kelly Murray is a first-round draft pick of the Open A. He got some, some million dollars in, in the draft choice. But he's a quarterback at, uh, at Oklahoma, and he may have to decide whether he wants to be a quarterback or a, or a baseball player. He has a baseball body. He's got 5'10", less than 200 pounds. It's hard to believe that he really wants to be a, base, a football player at his size. But on the other hand, players are, and he has options, and the money is bigger. So, um, although the money is bigger early, not later. Because baseball players may have bigger salaries over a period of time that they can get going. But that is, a, that is an issue that I think that baseball is concerned about. Uh, and I think it's uh, concerned about for that fan base as well. You know? Okay. I'm wondering, um, I know you came down to Salinas when Frank Alvarado Jr. and number of seven nine armed Latino men were killed by the by white Salinas. Police. Right. Call for federal investigation. I'm wondering your perspective on what happened with that and if anything came out of it. Well, the most, the most, uh, yeah, uh, Salinas. Uh, I've been in Salinas uh, a number of times. There's been several cases down there, mm -hmm. and and the federal investigation uh, came in as well, prompted uh, based upon my request. Well, I will say that as the federal investigation came about as a consequence various cases that were taking place and my um, view was that there may there's a pattern of discriminatory law enforcement here and that um, the feds should take a look at it. Well the feds also the community uh, community service again, both uh, OCC again, uh, the Department of Justice did come in and they did uh, conduct uh, an investigation and it was writing a report and was trying to implement some of the, the changes when the Obama administration went out. And when the Obama administration left, they left because that was something that Jeff Concession, the Attorney General, did not want to pursue. He was very much against uh, having the federal government involved in monitoring and evaluating police departments on the ground that he thought they infringed upon the, uh, uh, the freedom of police officers. So much did not go forward with that. And, and we're still working on a couple other cases. We've got a couple cases on appeal. Uh, but, you know, that's, um, that is a very difficult community to deal with. I must tell you, I have a sense of an almost an apartheid type feeling. And that's really, you know, it's a backward place that uh, uh, the Hispanic community is sort of under the thumb. And um, it's not a pleasant place to be for me. I didn't, I didn't feel I could do much there uh, because it was kind of, it wasn't, there wasn't an aggressiveness about trying to do something there. Uh, people were pretty much, and, and I got one of the reasons is you have a lot of undocumented people. And I have some of them. Those are difficult for the families involved because they don't want to get exposed. So I think the community itself is pretty much laboring under this, you know, um, they like the way things are. And the police, you know, police are what they are. So I haven't done any more down there. That's not to say I wouldn't take a case on but I have reservations about giving a lot of time for it. A DA here asked me a question because I was being tried and became a criminal, and I wasn't able to answer it. And friend said, "That's when you lost your jury's confidence." And his question was simple: Am I an activist or an advocate? Now I would like you to answer that for yourself. I need help. I was stunned. I didn't know. What did you answer the question? I did. I said, "Could you tell me the difference?" They didn't like that. <laughs> Ben, help me out with this. <laughs> Both. Well, you want me to answer for you, John? I, no, you can ask for you. I'm curious what you'd say about it. You're the criminal defense lawyer, so that's fine. I am. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't, I don't remember the facts of the case, but I think that if, if a lot of people in this room were asked that question, they'd probably say, well, I am both. I am both. Yeah. 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 I, I would, would say that's both. How I would well, it's a definitional question, but the, the outcome is the same. I mean, you're advocating for something, and uh, you've been at this for it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not doing a criminal defense work, so that's an interesting question, but I would say both. You know, and why not? Yeah. 
You said both? I should have. Yeah, right. Did you pick one? <laughs> I asked him, could you define the difference? Oh, I got that. <laughs> he didn't like it. He didn't like it. Okay. Well, I'm going to uh, run. I'm going to pass it back to some portion. Can you have one more question? Yeah, I have one more question. Okay. Okay. I, just, I had a question about your opinion since Rodney King uh, as far as police brutality. In your opinion, has it gotten any better as far as, um, obviously, because of funds, uh, we're able to see what's really going on? But do you think anything has changed since Rodney King and police brutality? Well, I would say, you know, that's a good question that I'm always saying. Um, uh, mostly, I would say, in some communities, yes, in a lot of communities, no. It's just a question of the political leadership of a particular community, whether or not they are prepared to hold offices accountable. Uh, some, office, some departments are more so than not. However, in cases that I've been involved in, I try to be involved in, um, I can see if, 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 the, if the leadership of the, of the department of the, um, wants to work with me, that, that's an indication that they want to hold the office accountable. But if they're not, and they, they want to blame me, then I know it's not. So, uh, but, um, you know, it's, it, it's been a changing world, uh, particularly with cameras. Um, and I can tell you that a lot of things that have taken place more recently in terms of some of the public uh, legislation that's occurred, those are sea changes. Those are real sea changes. I could not have dreamed when I started this business that we would have these accountability issues and the cell phone, the video uh, releases. And I've been involved in, in some of these things. So I see changes from a, uh, from, a, from a legislative point of view. And I think it will take time uh, for that to uh, become part of the, the culture of the department because the culture of the department defines how often move in that department. And, and, and so I think those are long-term solutions. But I, I like to think that it's that, that changes are occurring, and they have occurred in some places uh, in a very positive way, uh, but not completely. Uh, but, yeah, I see. Okay. Uh, decades later, in 1994, the ACLU of Maryland 
filed a class action lawsuit against the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, accusing the department of violating the Fair Housing Act by concentrating African-American public housing residents into poor, segregate, segregated areas of Baltimore City. So that was a pretty controversial uh, case. Uh, they actually won, although how it ended up getting uh, dealt with was had a, a long controversial history as well. Um, over the years, the ACLU has advocated tirelessly for laws prohibiting discrimination in housing on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. And, and even currently, the ACLU is involved in several legal battles to ensure that victims of domestic and sexual violence aren't additionally burdened by discrimination in housing. With the ACLU's history of fighting for fairness in housing, it's not surprising that the ACLU of Northern California jumped into the 2018 election, weighing in on two ballot proposals aimed at curbing skyrocketing rents and the subsequent gentrification associated with high housing costs. Uh, statewide, all three chapters of the ACLU endorsed Proposition 10 to repeal the Costa Hawkins Act, a law that limits the extent to which cities and counties can enact local rent control measures. Abdi Sultani, the executive director of the ACLU of Northern California, said, without affordable housing, it is impossible to achieve our mission of being a guardian of justice, fairness, equality, and freedom. Restoring the power of local communities to limit rent increases is a key component to making housing affordable for all Californians. Locally, the ACLU of Northern California also voted to endorse Measure M, stating, the vibrancy and prosperity of Santa Cruz depends on the well-being of all of its residents. When rent is too high, businesses struggle to retain employees and tenants face an increased risk of homelessness. When basic needs aren't met, people are at a greater risk of having their civil liberties violated. They are more likely to be criminalized, to have their property unconstitutionally confiscated, and to experience the unsafe conditions of sleeping and living on the street. For some, and I know people in this room, who found the decision of the ACLU of Northern California to endorse Measure M as surprising and controversial, Yet the decision was based on the stark reality that high housing costs disproportionately affect communities of color. A recent UC Berkeley study found that soaring housing costs are resegregating our communities. So resegregating communities that we have fought really hard to dis desegregate, but the, the data are just too damning. The researchers found that across the Bay Area, a 30% increase in median rent corresponded with more than 20% decrease in the number of low-income African Americans, Latinos, and Asians living there. The researchers found no significant relationship between rent increases and loss of low-income white housing. The high, house, the high cost of Santa Cruz housing is similar. Uh, there's been a little bit less research, but the No Place Like Home Project has done a really good job of tracking how high housing costs are affecting various communities. And they found that uh, Latinx folks are more likely to be rent burdened than white folks. Latinx folks are more than twice as likely to live in overcrowded conditions, which is often a response to high rents. And Latinx are the most likely demographic to face forced moves and displacement. For a group like the ACLU, who has long fought for justice, equality, and an end to segregated communities, these data were simply too damning, and that's why they ended up uh, agreeing to endorse Measure M. With the failure of both Proposition 10 and Measure M, Santa Cruz County, and indeed the entire state, will need to do some serious soul searching about how to maintain diverse and vibrant communities in the face of tremendous a tremendous trend towards gentrification. There are no easy answers to solving the housing crisis. The local ACLU does hope that we can come together as advocates for justice to address the serious challenges that face our community. And I think one thing that you know, pretty much everybody can agree on is the need for tenant advocates who understand and can communicate a tenant's legal rights. 
Surprisingly, however, tenants have very few legal resources, and tenant advocates who are available and diligent are, you know, they're scarce. And so people who do a really good job of that are an amazingly important asset for increasing housing justice in our community, mm -hmm. which is why I am proud to present the Hammer of Justice to Cynthia Berger. publications and journal entries. She is an endless source of information. Uh, she catalogs and tracks articles and studies that may be helpful to tenants and needs. And it's amazing if you call her or email her, all of a sudden she's like, oh yeah, I've got this article. Um, and I, it's just amazing that she's able to kind of keep track of all of that to sort of off the top of her head. Maybe it's not off the top of her head, but she makes it seem like it. Um, She's maintained her connections to tenants together and is still part of the larger statewide fight for tenants' rights. She even has a grasp on national issues affecting tenants and is able to synthesize national trends in housing and predict how they will affect tenants in Santa Cruz County. I got to know Cynthia because we worked together on the Yes on Measure M campaign and I have known her to be absolutely dedicated, hardworking, and unwavering in her commitment to justice. Santa Cruz is a better place because she is here doing her tireless work on behalf of renters. And so I am really proud to award the, the Hammer of Justice.
participate in, as Stacy mentioned, that, you know, there's a regional tenant organization for Northern California, and there's a, a growing tenant movement, and I'll, I'm going to talk about that a little bit, bit later. I did uh, kind of study rent control after it passed in two cities in Northern California in 2016, and then I did start a rent control study group in the summer of 2017, but it took off so fast we didn't really have time to study it, that then we might have passed it. But um, we had, we, it was a very quick uh, campaign, and uh, rent control usually takes three or four years to actually pass anywhere where it's, you know, from the time it's first brought up. Um, so, working for civil liberties is becoming a luxury and a privilege, you know, in a way. Before we can appreciate and exploit our civil liberties, we need a secure, stable base to move from. We need a shelter. It really helps. It's getting to be really hard for many California renters to think of themselves as long-term tenants. <clears throat> you know, to look at the upward crawl of rent compared to the flat line of wage growth, and um, income, and then also, you know, there's a housing uh, problem that's not predicted, at least by the developers in the real estate industry, who I think this is what they study. This isn't going to be, uh, this, there's no time when this will be any better. I mean, 50 years, it's going to be for generations because it's gotten so far behind since the mid 70s. So, um, this is an ongoing fight. A little, a little loss doesn't mean anything. A little loss was to be expected. Um, civil liberties uh, seem to exist in a lofty distance uh, for some people. For, for renters, uh, getting renters to write an email to the city council recently been criticized because the homeowners had 600 emails, but the renters didn't have more than 10. Mm -hmm. but, and this seems like such an easy step for organizers to achieve, but um, here's why they don't. If you go online and read the emails to the council in any city, uh, the names, emails, and sometimes addresses are available public information. So tenant block listing is a real thing. It's so real that the uh, legislation, the legislature of California made a law against it a couple of years ago. It's not just a made up thing. So there are you know, businesses who collect those names from those city council emails, and they sell those names to landlords. I would imagine that mostly the landlords that buy those are larger landlords. But it's a real thing. So, no, you're not going to get 600 letters from tenants, ever. But you might get them at the meeting. And so that's the time to listen to them. The time to listen to them is when they're in the room, for one thing. If they can get there, because they have so many jobs. But, um, <clears throat> so people have to take also into account that if a person is there who's a, a tenant speaking to the council, they represent a lot of more people who can't stand up. I know a, a landlord who threatened to evict her tenants by calling ICE because they're undocumented. They exist. And there's nothing you can do about it because those people don't want to stand up and raise their hand. Because many people across the country have been arrested in the, at the courthouse when they do that. So tenants are kind of in a squeeze for really getting their rights. and. Um, Just find my place here. Yeah, so and when you have tenants' rights, you know, like they pass this anti blacklisting law. Great, right? Well, the problem is that uh, for most tenants' rights, the tenants are the enforcers. The tenants themselves are the enforcers. That's not really that helpful. Tenants in myriad small claims cases bear the burden of proof. Uh, in all, unless they have a rent board, you know, there's a lot of different reasons for a rent board. You know, not just the reasons that whatever, whoever wrote against it enumerated. Um, there's a lot of subtle reasons and subtle ways that a rent board can help renters. And um, so these small claims cases, there are many small claims cases and then they all, uh, the tenants bear the burden of proof. With a rent board, a landlord might bear the burden of proof once in a while. So um, that's why a rent board is, is important. That's one reason. Um, you know, in all landlord tenant cases, about 90% of landlords access an attorney, whether it's a small claims court 
or a superior court, uh, a lawful detainer. 10% of tenants do that. Tenants make half as much as homeowners overall. And um, lawyers charge 300 and 400. So a, a tenant I know just called the lawyer to ask a simple question, which I could have answered for free. They wanted to charge her $400 in Santa Cruz um, because they needed to do some research. So there are no tenant lawyers in Santa Cruz. The only, there are very few tenant lawyers because they make their bread and butter from big cases. And then I have a tenant lawyer I work with. He's given hundreds of free consultations over the last few years. Um, and he works out of the Bay Area, but he grew up in Santa Cruz. So tenant, accessing tenant lawyers is, you know, there aren't very many of them. And um, besides, you can't take them into court with you anyway, right? So tenants have, um, so then we have legal aid in Santa Cruz County, and it's almost exclusively landlord-tenant cases. And the wait for an appointment in the city um, for a city resident can be a month or more. You might get a 30-day notice and have an issue with it. You're out of luck. So for, for the dimensions of the rental crisis, the lack of legal aid for middle class to poor, down to poor tenants, because middle class people can, can now you know, qualify for being low income around here, um, is kind of criminal. In previous years, the city of Santa Cruz, um, when lawyers charged less, and when the wage to rent differential was bad and not excruciatingly horrible like now, the city of Santa Cruz would budget well over $100,000 for CRLA, California Rural Legal Assistance, our legal aid for people who aren't seniors. Um, and um, they get uh, seniors go to senior legal services. They're also underfunded. But, um, so in 2017, in the middle of the worst you know, rental crisis ever, the City Council of Santa Cruz budgeted exactly zero dollars for legal aid. And um, then the next year, they budgeted $15,000 for a little, because they had some pressure put on them by activists. And that wasn't enough because the insurance costs were going to keep that up, a lot of that up. So I just, uh, you know, in a conversation with the director of CRLA, Gretchen Wiggenhart, she said that really to have a good program where you have a lawyer that can do 10 unlawful detainer cases in a year, that's only 10. Thousands of people are being evicted. Some of them are unlawful detainers, but it's more than 10. You need $200,000 to run your business and, and have 10 unlawful detainer, um, because a, an unlawful detainer takes a lot of paper. It's a lot of papering. And, um, so, you know, you want to also be able to offer some tenant counseling, letter writing, and stuff that doesn't involve a lawyer in court. So $200,000 is more like it. And um, so to, to get an allocation of that kind of magnitude and to have enforcement that's meaningful, and especially to pass rent control, which is the only act that can stabilize and protect any group of renters, not all renters, but thousands of renters, Rather than zero renters, which is what you get if you don't pass rent control, you protect zero renters. Um, so, you know, you've got to organize renters. As difficult as it may be, it's the overarching goal of the late 2000s, the late 2000 teens of California amalgamating tenants movement. Um, homeowners and landlords have demonstrated the baseline for passing laws favorable to your interests. And they've set an example, a baseline, a goal, and a target for tenants. But reactionary activism hasn't worked. A new political analysis of tenant organizing is currently going on all around the country, and especially, of course, in California. Um, new models are being created, proposed, and discussed of tenant organizing. Um, we're going to figure out exactly how to win rent control campaigns. Um, it's a simply we've observed over the past two years the same tactics that would, you know, they pay for a lot of the, the landlords, uh, California Partner Association, we'll, we'll, we'll use them as a symbol, but they, they have a lot of money to pay for a lot of, you know, psychological data about people and how they respond. They did a lot of polling during Measure M with different groups, what should we say to renters to make them afraid to vote against it? What should we say to homeowners? What should we say? So anyway, we are going to, to learn how to pass rent control, but really the most effective way to do that is just to 
pass it at the state level. So yes. that will be the, uh, a, a, a larger movement that will be starting up. These things all take time, of course. Um, yeah, so that's about all I really have to say right now. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them.
Gateway Camp or Ross Camp or whatever you want to call it. Every Thursday, she treats everyone, every single person. I, I go there every once in a while uh, to Coral Street. I've been there. And she treats everyone with such compassion and dignity to every single person who comes to her. And she's integral to harm reduction. She is a person I look up to. Every single person who comes to her for support, she treats with the utmost respect. The trust she has built in this community amazes me, and I'm in awe. Harm reduction is grounded in justice and human rights. It focuses on positive change and on working with people without judgment, coercion, discrimination, or requiring that they stop using drugs as a precondition of support. There's no one else who can represent harm reduction better than Denise. Denise is a person who is totally committed to social justice. Thank you.
just wonderful people, but they're on the streets and they're struggling and they deserve, they are our neighbors, they're our community, they deserve health care and they deserve dignity and, and I can tell you for a fact that they are just as frustrated with syringe litter as everyone is and they are picking up syringe litter like you cannot believe. I just, I, I have a, somebody will come by with a sunglass case and it's just stuck with syringe cases. I don't want any back, I just pick these up. And, and they are exactly who we need out on the ground doing the cleanup work and, and talking to each other when they see somebody, you know, chuck a, a syringe because it's very upsetting. Um, but this community doesn't even know what it would look like without a program because we've had a program since the late 80s. So we, are, we already have the solution in place and we didn't have the CDC coming down on us after 2014 saying you better start a program because your community's at risk because we had one already going. So um, we have a lot of improvements to do. Um, March In March, the um, uh, Santa Cruz AIDS Project is working with me and the Harm Reduction Coalition and we've invited a speaker down from Oakland and she used to live in Santa Cruz and volunteer with Street Outreach Supporters. She's been tar in charge of training at the Harm Reduction Coalition in all, um, Oakland and she's going to come down and hold a training for service providers and nurses and everybody at the SSP and HPHP to um, teach people safe injection techniques and sterile techniques because um, we're the hospital is are impacted with a lot of uh, people with um, um, injection infections and abscesses and they need health care and we can do a lot to prevent some of those um, those issues and and then we'll take it out into the community and also wound care people are taking care of uh, amazing um, their friends they're taking really good care of their friends in this time so um, we are also the county is rolling out a ton more medication assisted treatment um, more than we ever have and and it's and it's still not the perfect answer we just can't force people to stop doing what they're doing and you're all arm reductions and you came here today wearing a seatbelt or a bike helmet or crossing a crosswalk you're now harm reductionist so we are doing the same thing with substance use. We can't stop it. It's a part of our culture. It's always going to be around. Yes, we're living in a very strange time. We're also living into a time that where we don't embrace science and data. And this is Santa Cruz, and we embrace science and data. So um, I, I just really look forward to the future and uh, branching out more in Watsonville. Some very exciting um, uh, outreach from Watsonville, the Salvation Army, they want very much to have services down there for their winter shelter and their day use services. They see the need and Watsonville is the distant second step cousin who doesn't get the services that they deserve. And um, they have uh, very few hours of clinic support. So it's going to take a lot of um, effort. Um, to work with the county, with other community-based organizations, and we, can all, we all want the same thing. We want people to have access to health care and connection with other people, not alone, not isolated, not shamed, not um, uh, stigmatized for their, their use. So, um, so um, anyway, thank you very much. I hope I can uh, honor this award and continue to um, do more uh, work in the community because this is this was pretty unexpected. Exposing racism, sexism, 
and violence wow, gets right. media. <clears throat> violence against, against women in the media her whole life. I first met Anne when she was an organizer and the face that kick out the Miss, Miss California pageant out of Santa Cruz. She educated the community. She educated this community about the stereotyping and degradation of young women in so-called beauty pageants. She was brilliant in her approach, and she won. Over the years, Anne has dedicated herself to finding media image, images that cheapen women. She created the website Media Watch that exposes how the media industry continues to insult and diminish women through advertising and visual imagery. Much of what Anne has done has been a personal as well as financial sacrifice. She has lectured throughout the country how stereotyped images of women contribute to institutional sexism. How these images not only devalue women because they cause the collective inequality in our nation's psyche that stops our mission from moving forward towards equality. Anne was the voice of Me Too long before that phase was ever uttered. I'm just sorry we weren't listening. <laughs> Anne has always been full of big ideas that changed our community and the world around us. Anne has a form of spiritual activism that inspires us. She is a sound of genuine. Her voice today is stronger than ever in the continuing fight against sexism, misogyny, and racism is Anne that stands out in our community. In this lifelong act, this is a lifelong activism award, and that's the reason Anne is giving it to Anne. I, I just want to say something. I know that my grandchildren will be better off because of Anne. <laughs> this award is given in the name of Paul Johnson, another longtime activist, now deceased. And it's all yours. You deserve it. <laughs> Shout out for those uh, activists that are gluing themselves to buildings, for example. 
I love that. I love the idea of uh, these rebel for life activists that are going up on buildings and spray painting frack off and stuff like this. this is, these people are people that we, are, we really need now more than ever. And we can start to think, you know, what some of the most inspiring ones are the Parkland uh, high school students for me personally, because they're young. And that's where we need to focus. We need to focus on youth, and we need to inspire the youth to constantly understand the importance of standing up and speaking out. Because if I do it, maybe I'm going to inspire one other person to do it as well. If you see me uh, going after a bully, and, and you know, think, oh, uh, look, she's doing that all alone. Maybe I'll help her. <laughs> and so that's how I became active with Nikki Craft actually uh, going in there and she was going in to get arrested one afternoon and I thought oh geez you're getting arrested and I, I joined her and I never stopped to join her <laughs> and joining the, the work that I've been arrested 11 times which I'm very proud of and I, I really believe that we have a, a very important response ability I like to see those words separated and that we have the ability to respond. We are privy to a lot of violence, sexism, racism, attacks on renters, attacks on so many homeless people, or just the attacks on a poor. We have an opportunity to speak up in those situations. And we have a responsibility to speak up in those situations. And if you think that this is something that's just oh, it's a private thing, or he's hitting her, but maybe it's something I don't want to really get myself involved in. It, it's, it's more important to stand up and involve yourself. I think it's a responsibility as a part of being human. Yes. And I think I've gotten a lot of my courage from doing the work that I do, from uh, being gang raped at knife point. I was almost murdered at the age of 19. And so, hey, you know, life is good. I'm here. <laughs> I'm still here. And that's what—that's the kind of uh, joie de vivre, the in, in, interest in life that I think we all need to remember on a daily basis to be active, never give up. And thank you so much for this. Thank you all for coming. Yeah.